So our, our, next, our, our next presenter, our first presenter of the day, uh, is Jeff Becker. Uh, Jeff Becker is uh, really, he's a consultant on the joint staff. And what that means to everybody here is he's the principal author of the joint operational environment. So if you've never read the joint operational environment, you ought to take a look at it. Uh, Jeff has really been the, was the key driver behind it, did much of the writing, and uh, brought together teams to think about it. So the way the joint community thinks about the operational environment, Jeff has a lot to do with. Well, he, he wrote a great paper, which was the best one that was uh, sent in for this conference of about 30 papers. Uh, his paper has been published with Real Clear Defense and Small Wars Journal, so it has a, it's been moved around a lot. A lot of people have been reading it. Uh, it's titled, if you look at your agenda, How Lethal, Mobile, Protected, and Aware, Exploring the Art of the Possible and Future Infantry Combat. And uh, I recommend that after Jeff's presentation that you pull it down off the web and take, take a look at it and read. What, what was attractive to us about the paper was a lot of people describe the environment, but, a lot of, but not many actually try to develop solutions or ideas. And Jeff's paper did that. Uh, so it was what really stood out to us, Jeff, of what you sent in, is you actually went beyond describing and actually took a shot at what this could mean. And when you do that, you put yourself at risk because when you start giving solutions, then people start throwing darts. And Jeff took a risk and wrote a great paper. So we look forward to your presentation. All right, thank you. And that brings to mind, uh, you know, one of the things that people from the services and the joint uh, and, the, and the combatant commands uh, don't like to hear. It's, uh, I'm from the joint staff and I'm here to help. Uh, so, but I am. And so the, uh, that, the uh, discussions this morning brought to, to mind two things about the future that I kind of want to set in your mind. The first of those is that today's luxuries are tomorrow's necessities. And that's just kind of a way that humans kind of react to the world. And the second of those things is really about um, that the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. Um, again, I'm uh, Jeff Becker, and I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you a little bit about the paper that I wrote for this and how multi-domain battle might manifest in the future. And again, as background, I support the Joint Staff J7 and their work in as their chief futurist, and that major pro project is the Joint Operating to uh, Environment 2035. And I've been in this business for a while, uh, almost 20 years in the futures business, working on a uh, wide a range of projects. But one of the observations I've found, and there are two things that I kind of want you to set aside and, and when you're thinking about the future, and, and really um, there are things that us futurists love to do. And the first of those is to talk about grand strategy. We love to talk about who's up, who's down, where population's gonna be, where people are moving, where they're living. Um, what year will China's GDP surpass us, and what does that mean? And those are all interesting and useful questions, but for us at the joint level and at the service level, I, I think that these questions don't always naturally connect to the nature of war. And they don't really talk about the implications of that change for the structure and function of the forces. So that's one of the, what I call sins of futuring. And the second of these is we really love to admire individual technologies or capabilities and tend to spend a lot of time talking about whether or not a particular technology is evolving linearly? Is it evolving exponentially? Uh, when's a technology going to uh, arrive? What are the you know, amazing things that this technology is going to do for us uh, when it gets here? So we tend to focus a lot on the what and really less uh, on the all-important question of so what. And so what in the context of how wars will be fought and, uh, and what that means for the structure and, again, function of the forces that we need. Um, when Tradoc asked us all to visualize multi-domain battle, I was really excited to try and avoid these sins of futuring and really think through how a whole family of technological changes um, might converge, combine, and how those things might uh, create new sources of military advantage. And I wanted to do it in the land domain, and I wanted to do it um, really at the squad or unit level. I really want to understand how small units might actually be constructed in such a way to be multi-domain in nature and what the existence and operation of these kind of units uh, might mean in terms of larger joint force operations. And these issues really all resolved um, in the research question, the personal research question you see in the title of my slide here, uh, given the emerging view of adversary military modernization and a somewhat bewildering array of technologies that are in front of us, um, just how lethal, mobile, protected, and aware might you make a very small, say, 12 to 15 person unit on the future battlefield? Uh, so first, a little bit of perspective 
on why this should be a question for us at all. To my mind, the Joint Force has been highly successful in conducting operations uh, frequently at long range, say from five kilometers out to 500 kilometers. And the examples of this are many, from uh, highly public long range uh, cruise missile strikes uh, to an unblemished U.S. air to air uh, record since about two, uh, 1991, the Battle of 73 Easting, and the really popular uh, online genre of uh, patchy gun camera video, which you can find all over YouTube. Um, but today, there's an array of ongoing uh, sort of joint and service concepts that really recognize that uh, competitor military modernization, particularly in places like China, Russia, Iran, and elsewhere, creating new and difficult challenges for the joint force and causing us to really relook the ways uh, of operating and the capabilities that underpin our way of war. Um, concepts like joint operational access, joint entry operations, um, joint concepts for maintaining access in the global commons, um, and also uh, now multi-domain battle are all working hard to ensure that the U.S. really isn't caught unprepared. But despite all this activity, I still believe that it, at the five meter and five, you know, at the ranges between five meters and five kilometers uh, that typify small unit action in the land domain, U.S. advantages, particularly integrated technologies for the soldier, uh, have been far less pronounced. And although U.S. training and tactical prowess are really unmatched, Land combat is marked by difficult and complicated terrain, including dense urban environments. Um, it's really marked by fear, confusion, terror, um, rapidly shifting battlefield conditions, and the, again, the sheer violence uh, that have defined small unit action throughout history. And the two pictures I use uh, on the slide here, I think really illustrate that dramatic uh, contrast between how we train and equip warfighters in different domains. On the left, We've got a $400,000 helmet to equip our F-35 pilots to operate a hundred to $200 million aircraft to deliver joint effects from the air domain. On the right, we see the all, typical, uh, all too typical situation of our land forces. Uh, the soldier is unaugmented and in this case, completely unarmored. Helmet mounted systems aren't integrated to his weapons. And if the photo on the right were taken today, and this was taken uh, over 10 years ago, um, uh, he'd have another 45 pounds of body armor uh, on top of this. So he's got to carry massive stores by muscle power alone and probably arriving at the battle really exhausted and less prepared for the fight than might otherwise be possible. I think the courage, the endurance, the sheer force of will that the individual in the photo at right is really apparent, but I believe that not only can we do better, but in the future operating environment, we're going to have to do better. Uh, how do we give small units some of the advantages that the joint force enjoys in other domains and do it so that the land force isn't only the supported element in the future, but contributes to multi-domain uh, approach in which small units can enable other elements of the joint force uh, as well. So when thinking about the future, it's a really good idea to clarify in our minds um, what we believe is actually changing. And any thinking about the future requires us to strike what I call a delicate balance between, on one hand, credibility of our observations and innovation. And what I mean by this is any view of the future really has to be um, grounded in reality, uh, but a view of the future that's too anchored in today risks missing important changes that occur outside of our regular experience. Uh, because of this, futures thinking has to also be coupled by enough courage and fortitude and open-mindedness to step outside some of our certitudes and our assumptions of today, and uh, even counterintuitive or challenging conditions that might alter our world. The future won't be like today, only more so. Uh, thus, a well-constructed look at the future has to, at times, include stretches of the imagination, sometimes pushing the boundaries of credible or respectable intelligence analysis to place the reader in a future that's really substantially different or easy, even uh, disorienting. Um, the slide again here shows you where I attempted to set the balance between credibility and innovation for the study uh, to, uh, that I'll be talking about today. I relied on a set of technologies that are definitely possible given the uh, trajectory of technologies, uh, but are, not all are guaranteed. Uh, some investments in development will be uh, needed to get there. Um, but uh, again, this gives you kind of this, this framework and some of the technologies in this uh, more than possible but less than probable sort of uh, time frame at the small unit level are the proliferation of adversary battle networks, 
a range of reconnaissance strike networks uh, involving a panoply of multispectral sensors, all geared to find, fix, and finish uh, current U.S. forces, including, again, things like as, uh, as small as cell phones, all the way up to high-quality optical, LIDAR, and other sensors. And those will all be easy to come by in the future operating environment. They'll be everywhere, and increasingly the data they produce will be collected and correlated through big data analytic techniques in order to learn things about that information. Second of those big technological trends is the primacy of kinetic warheads over physical armor and protection systems. And kinetic uh, weaponry is rapidly outpacing our ability to protect through physical heavy armor plating. Some of the advances include nano explosives, energetic materials, thermobarics, um, and a whole range of lower technology IEDs and mines that conspire to really uh, put investments in armor on the wrong side of the, of the uh, investment uh, curve. Uh, the third of these uh, big technological areas are the proliferation of lasers, directed energy, and electronic warfare. And by 2035, we're going to see affordable, powerful, and increase, increasingly compact electromagnetic uh, and directed energy systems appearing at scale on the battlefield. Uh, and th if those things are arranged and employed correctly, may deny the ability of, of uh, forces to find and fix. The fourth of these is cheap and plentiful AI, and over the next two decades, we'll see an increasingly cognitized world, uh, meaning that thinking machines will be everywhere, and the emergence of high-quality visual recognition technologies, um, algorithms, big data analytics, and massive processing power, which will be available and integrate large numbers of the high-quality sensors I mentioned earlier. Fifth of these big trends is robotics everywhere, and we're really finally on the cusp of a, a robotics revolution. Um, AI and machine learning will all be embodied in a wide range of robots, um, and commercial robots, cars, trucks, will share our roads, but by 2035, they'll probably outnumber human vehicles, and uh, in some places in the world, human drivers might even be forbidden. Um, it may be uh, too dangerous for humans to be behind the wheel. Uh, the sixth of these is machine, uh, human-machine teaming. We're going to see a number of advances. Uh, humans are generally better at understanding context, providing structure. Uh, in an otherwise unstructured environment. But robots are generally not good at this, but they're tireless, fearless, and relentless. And advances in controlling the shape of de the decisions of, uh, for robotic systems, rather than direct control of the platform, will be where investments will go. I'll say mission command is going to move from commanding people to mission commanding robots. Uh, the seventh and last of the big trends that I considered here is electric and hybrid power. There will be massive advances in uh, battery manufacturing, hybrid vehicles coupled with power foraging, um, which has a potential to reduce the logistics burden and expand the range of units. If we truly believe that the future is going to be urban, then those urban areas will be electrified and power scavenging will be something that we can use to extend the range of our hybrid vehicles going forward. So with that sort of, with that sort of landscape in place. I really wanted to get to the harder part. I mentioned earlier how critical it is that we don't examine or worse pursue individual technologies for their own sake. But we have to understand how each uh, might really work within a larger tactical system and one that provides an interlocking set of capabilities that exploit advantages and minimize uh, disadvantages. Um, you can see the, an OSD net assessment study uh, here notes that military advantage rests on a bedrock of advantage in tactical combat. Tactical combat is defined by, as the sphere of direct physical interaction uh, between combatants, and advantage is often a combination of armament and tactics uh, integrated into a coherent tactical system that decisively uh, defeats the opponent's tactical system. And the graphic you see here, and one of the key ideas that led me down this path, uh, was the nature of the defensive and offensive um, um, among differently configured units. Uh, and the study notes that these interlocking small units trade aspects of mobility, lethality, and protection in order to achieve some advantageous military characteristic. Um, and I think on the future battlefield, uh, you have to also add that attribute of awareness. Um, uh, again, as the battlefield cleared out, uh, the ability to put ordnance on target at long range was, uh, uh, again, something that was as important so that unit knew how it was oriented and that sort of thing. So really, it's about uh, which uh, that piece of it is why you see battle networks that have emerged uh, so widely in the world. But successful armies are able, in my mind, uh, able to um, put together units that are distinct in their mobility, protection, firepower, and awareness, and how they provide that on the battlefield. Uh, and again, on the current battlefield, the ability to punch through armor with kinetic weaponry of all types, guns, missiles, artilleries, IEDs, 
um, et cetera, will be very difficult to solve with mass and steel. Uh, moreover, the penalties of heavy armor in terms of strategic and operational mobility and the need for infra infrastructure to support it are creating some uh, adv uh, disadvantages that adversaries are exploiting. So the multi-domain uh, battle concept really poses, uh, posits an adversary that's designed forces uh, based on this belief. Uh, in this case, the defeat mechanism for the US lies in separating the joint force over time and by function and then capitalize on this, on this fracturing of the joint force to seize and retain key terrain and defeat uh, the interdependent friendly units uh, isolated from external support. And again, in a world where adversaries find them, where uh, land forces find themselves uh, in a battle network enabled environment, uh, units are vulnerable to observation and tracking or engagement by precision fire from all ranges by that, those sensor nets. And much like World War I, the defense uh, in the land domain is ascendant. And in the past, these problems were solved by the introduction of radio, uh, the internal combustion engine, uh, storm troop and infiltration tactics. Um, and today we have to understand how to engage these battle networks um, and uh, restore a measure of uh, mobility and maneuver to the battlefield to defeat the enemy in the close area, from the close area, by integrating domains at the lowest tactical level. Why? Uh, and again, I just put this uh, phrase up here to really bring it back to the Army because, uh, again, uh, getting away from that notion of always moving to the grand strategic, talking about some of the bigger issues, the, when we talk about what the Army is for, in my mind, it's we need to be able to build future land forces that can protect, transit, seize, and hold land terrain and populations while influencing or interrupting adversary activities in adjacent domains. So with that in mind, let's kind of move to force design. Let's move to some of the elements that would constitute a future uh, multi-domain Dragoon squad. In our own tactical system uh, today, I would suggest that adversaries are really looking at our, our approach, approach to the rock, scissors, paper game, uh, as I showed two slides ago, and are designing these operational approaches to take advantage of our underinvestment in operational mobility and our awareness portfolio balance too heavy at seeing and sharing data amongst ourselves uh, rather than denying awareness to the enemy on the battlefield. Uh, I'd suggest as a rule that current tactical systems can be vastly improved by transforming also how we view protection on this future battlefield. Um, and let's take a look uh, back here, the picture I have here. Uh, historically, Dragoon units referred to um, types of units that combine the all-terrain close fight capabilities of infantry with the operational mobility and flexibility of mounted cavalry. Uh, typically, Dragoon units uh, would move deeply across the battlefield, dismount to attack fixed positions or units by closing and destroying with, rather than raiding or even earlier, the shock effect uh, that was generated against infantry. Um, Dragoons uh, provided ground commanders the ability to disrupt or unhinge prepared defenses uh, over long ranges. And although relatively weak in protection and long range firepower, these units relied on tactical maneuver, operational mobility, initiative, and surprise as well as close in lethality to provide a potent mix of capabilities on the battlefield at the time. So I'd argue uh, that the evolution of adversary stratagems and weapons technology mean that there may be a future for these Dragoon-like units uh, in the future army. The basic trade underpinning uh, these is to respect the advantages of raw kinetic firepower over any foreseeable physical armor and reject penalties in unit mobility and logistics fuel support associated with heavy armored forces and develop units that can instead leverage enhanced all electric mobility, protection through lasers and squad level electronic warfare, as well as uh, AI enabled tactics, uh, tactical queuing and battle management. So what are some of the innovations we need to get uh, to this Dragoon squad of the future? So let's start with the individual soldier. And the most important thing we need to win in a complicated future battle space is a mind that's able to pilot the unit, uh, concentrating on guiding and directing tactical engagements and on developing and exploiting opportunities. Uh, machines, vehicles, and robots are far better suited to the task of sort of carrying loads and, and uh, do it without long-term damage. But MDS members should instead focus on arriving at peak efficiency and that the unit as a whole is taking advantage of the inherent respective strengths of humans, machines, and computers. So some of the things you can see on the slide here, um, you, and you hear about these individual technologies, but exosuit, uh, exosuit capabilities to provide extra endurance, heavier weapons, uh, lightweight uh, helmet-mounted display to provide 
augmented reality as well as virtual reality pictures based on seeds, uh, seed, uh, um, any sensor feeds from across the joint force and place it uh, inside the field of vision. Uh, individual weapons should include uh, uh, laser precision guided uh, munitions, uh, OCIW like projectiles for precision and counter defilade attacks uh, and haptics and other cues from the battle space in order to coordinate. Um, but really the communication suite, helmet mounted displays and associated tablets uh, should allow for new levels of close in situational awareness. For example, as the system is uh, scanning uh, across the environment, uh, providing uh, facial recognition and that sort of technology and being able to keep that, uh, keep that uh, in mind. Uh, also, the HUD may allow the soldier to fly through an environment before physically doing uh, so while well, personal biometric instrumentation, you know, again, conducts these constant scans on the battlefield. Uh, tactical cyber capabilities, such as the ability to interdict and disrupt automated car driving systems that we heard about. Uh, and again, uh, uh, AI-enabled assistants that go into that city uh, environment and make sure cameras are turned away from the unit and nothing is really able to observe the unit. Uh, the weapon system itself uh, uh, should have a laser on it to be able to mark targets uh, and keep those in mind as well going through and uh, help uh, the unit identify friend and foe. But again, the bottom line is the individual soldier should become a sensor and a battle director. And more important thing is uh, that humans uh, can do that robots can't yet do is to really understand context in unstructured environments. Um, the key task for the soldier won't be to carry things or even shoot things, but to develop a tactical situation using these tools at his disposal um, uh, to really understand, uh, the, again, the context of a situation and provide the structure needed for robotics uh, systems to operate best. Uh, the suite of technologies available is really about marking and classifying the environment, setting parameters. For example, is our unit in a uh, heavy lethal combat? Do I need weapons release on a tighter tether? Is the situation changing and do I need to reset some parameter of the robotics uh, and munitions profile? But let, much like the American mechanized forces in the Second World War took advantage of machine-minded farmers and urban auto enthusiasts, the MDS should take advantage of the information-minded, connected, sharp-reflexed young Americans of 2035, 2050, using these tools to conduct 3D interactive mission planning, surveillance, tagging, marking, uh, and engaging. So there's no such thing as a Dragoon unit without a mount. And for this unit, uh, we envision um, Something like, uh, you can see on the right, on the left side of the slide here, the uh, infantry mobility vehicle, 4,500 uh, 4, pound class wheeled vehicle carrying capacity, uh, 2,500 pounds or so, range of say 400 miles. Um, and again, I provided several examples of the basic size and weight here. Um, but the IMV is really uh, supposed to be semi-autonomous, capable of being driven by a squad member, uh, but also played in, uh, placed in autonomous mode, remotely controlled by the fire team leader to maneuver in, concept, in concert with the dismounted fire team. Um, the IMV propulsion would be hybrid design with an electric drivetrain supported by batteries. Uh, but also able to power up uh, the batteries with a small internal combustion engine. Uh, but each vehicle, again, should be capable of scavenging electricity uh, in the environment where necessary. Uh, but the core of the, um, the core of the IMV is really uh, the ability to provide overwatch and fire support for the fire team during an assault. Um, this covering fire is provided by this core offensive uh, element of the vehicle, which is a robotic turret which includes a variable power laser of between 10 and 50 kilowatts, a crew serve machine uh, gun of, of 50 caliber or higher, precision indirect fires weapon providing a range of effects such as high explosive, counter defilade, uh, fragmentation, thermobaric or high power microwave burst depending on the tactical situation. But the turret should fe uh, feature this low, uh, low power laser LIDAR system that's constantly scanning the environment looking for optics and sensors that are observing the unit uh, quickly slewing to dazzle uh, the target, and then uh, based on what, uh, passing that information either to a fire team leader or using the AI-enabled uh, target recognition, uh, putting uh, rounds downrange immediately. Uh, uh, so basically providing this sort of optical shield for the unit. Um, the, again, uh, the, the uh, in combination, uh, the vehicles uh, of the uh, Dragoon Squad really 
um, provide this optical shield for the MDS against observation from ground threats, UAVs, or other aerial, aerial vehicles, and collaborate to manage the tactical sensor fight. Uh, again, conducting tactical blinding versus optics and dazzling against eyes. Uh, and again, if linked to higher units, these sensors can pass uh, refined data to brigade level uh, laser IADs or other units uh, and sensor data uh, to, uh, again, refine track data and that sort of thing. Um, so the next element uh, we'd look at is the uh, mobile robotics support. Um, and think of this as the uh, sort of Swiss army knife of robotic support to the squad. Uh, and the way we've sort of, I've, I've sort of configured this here is a mobile robotics vehicle that uh, carries most of the robotic uh, systems into, into the fight uh, and then uh, arranges them in tactical array when uh, the unit's ready to uh, sort of engage. But really it provides the power, the updates, um, and uh, really the computing backbone for all the robotic systems. Um, and also connects the MDS to other Army and Joint Force elements. Uh, but again, there's a range of uh, robotic systems that might be available uh, to such a uh, unit, but uh, sort of to really uh, stretch our minds here, I sort of env envision it as being a cheetah-sized uh, vehicle running on four legs, able to go maybe 40, 50 miles an hour over land. Uh, again, that unit, uh, that robot being armed uh, with a range of sort of agents from culminative agents all the way through lethal um, uh, fires, but to, to, to push those out in front of the unit in order to develop a situation. They could also be wheeled, as you can see at the bottom uh, left as well. Um, but really, the, um, together, uh, the robotics and munitions can flush or clear buildings, bunkers, confined spaces, maneuver behind walls or barriers, find, fix, or displace adversary combatants. And each uh, armed reconnaissance bot really should be armed with small caliber weapons to engage targets of opportunity and provide covering fire while the rest of the unit's uh, advancing or during a withdrawal. Uh, again, the MDS should be supported by, as you can see at the top right here, organic air support. Again, provided by perhaps an array of quadcopter type drones, short range, low altitude systems that provide optical uh, and electronic sensing to the unit, uh, but also providing constant updates to the, uh, uh, to the uh, augmented reality, virtual reality backbone. Um, again, these systems can be armed uh, with small caliber weapons and a laser designator to designate attacks for the rest of the unit as well. Um, but again, uh, the uh, robotic systems should be able to be modular and uh, replaceable, but also carried by this uh, mothership as well. And the final element that we would uh, want in a small unit of this type is a squad indirect fire support vehicle. Uh, again, provides a range of indirect fires directly to each team. Uh, built on the same platform as the last vehicle, uh, this carries a bed of vertical launch ro uh, racks, much like the Navy's shipborne VLS system, but on a much smaller scale, to provide a range of on-demand munitions to the squad. Um, but again, uh, these are optimized to provide precision coverage out to five miles. The, um, any loitering um, lethal air, uh, missile system available in the MDS should be configurable to, develop multi, to deliver multi-mode warheads, include top attack and uh, anti-armor shaped charges, but uh, should be um, able to be directed by the squad members through their uh, laser systems on their individual weapons. Uh, and again, the, each of the weapons, you can see some very small examples here, but uh, this is a five mile range weapon that's laser guided. You can imagine it coming out of the top of the uh, vehicle and uh, being able to uh, attack targets uh, at the behest of the squad. So I cautioned early in my brief, one of the sins of futuring really is an overfocus on a particular technology. So again, putting this all together, what it's all about, um, is uh, really the vision for this unit is to unhinge modern uh, and irregular defensive systems by disrupting adversary battle networks and conducting rapid and unexpected movements on the battlefield while threatening the delivery of overwhelming small unit uh, fires. So you can see the basic echeloning of the force here, robotics out in front, uh, fire teams uh, on each of the IMVs backed by the indirect fire support vehicle, and the mobile robotic support vehicle, all welded together into a, a single tactical system. So again, bringing the pieces together, you've got the exoskeleton, the ARVR-enabled uh, infantry fire team, semi-robotic turreted IFV, 
Uh, you've got uh, mobile robotics, power, computing support vehicle, and indirect fire support that all constitute, in my mind, a tactical coherent, uh, t a coherent tactical system that can develop several advantages for the joint force. Uh, again, as I noted uh, before, the overall tactical system, the MDS, presumes that projected physical armor um, really will far outpace advances in kinetic warhead technology. And the basic trade underpinning uh, the MDS is, is to um, is to really uh, go for mobility and go for counter uh, observation. So what would uh, a force like this, how would this uh, fit into the larger joint force? Again, uh, section three of the Joe uh, provides a mission matrix of 24 joint force missions that the force may have to do. I sort of picked three uh, to take a look at how the MDS might fight in that environment. Global maneuver and seizure, uh, defense support to stabilization, and uh, really major sustained combat. Um, again, you can see that these are designed, uh, missions designed to disrupt or degrade, compel or destroy adversary forces on the battlefield. So uh, during a global maneuver and seizure operation, uh, the MDS can be part of a wide ranging theater infiltration capability to contribute to the disruption and uh, unhinging of prepared defenses, um, shattering the cohesion of enemy uh, multi-domain forces and creating temporary windows of advantage throughout the depth of the battlefield. The MDS's small and relatively self-contained forces can enter the battlefield at significant offset um, from uh, targets and its high mobility allows it to appear in unexpected places and maneuver under adversaries A to AD umbrella. Uh, concentrating combat power against aerial or maritime strong points, but weakly defended in the land domain. Uh, the, um, when you're looking at, for example, um, uh, a uh, moving MDS capable of asse uh, really assessing the defenses at close range, capable of delivering a range of lethal and electronic fires or cyber payloads, uh, and opening operational lanes to be exploited uh, by the rest of the force. Um, during a defense support to stabilization operations, the joint force could take uh, advantage of the MDS's high degree of uh, human-scaled situational awareness, reaction time, personal lethality. Uh, during operations, the MDS can contribute to provide more detailed resolution uh, at that five to five uh, mile range uh, with its arrayed robotic systems, optical uh, systems, and can be used to secure population, key terrain, positions and infrastructure, protect local government officials, uh, and operating in close proximity uh, using its, uh, using its uh, integral um, robotic systems. Again, uh, finally, during a major sustained combat, the joint force may take advantage of the MDS's unique ability to restrict and channel um, adversary movements um, uh, the size and dispersal of the unit really means that it's difficult to engage uh, by a range of systems uh, th through the uh, battle network. Um, and again, uh, it might be useful uh, as the Russian New Generation Warfare Study recently showed to uh, really pick out uh, Russian screening sniper forces uh, by picking out the optics and, and uh, opening again lanes for larger heavy uh, vehicles. Um, uh, larger heavy units to, uh, to attack the main body. Uh, during major sustained combat, um, again, uh, the, it really is about uh, um, moving to position and not allowing the, the uh, adversary forces to find or fix U.S. forces. So operating in the context of the larger joint force, the MGS really projects combat power through its unique tactical system. Um, as the Army, uh, really to assist the Army. And as a former mad scientist presenter, uh, Albert Palazzo and Dave McLean put it, uh, to close with and defeat enemies in close proximity to civilian populations while max minimizing collateral damage. Um, but in my mind, the essence of multi domain battle really reflects the quote from the famous Chinese colonels of unrestricted warfare fame. Uh, that is the ability to, for, of a land force to bring together unexpected and irresistible combinations. Um, and uh, a concept like the MDS illustrates how from the bottom up, the future army may need to fight. Other units, long range fires, heavy combat systems, uh, maritime, naval, and space uh, units will also be required. The MDS isn't the army, it's just a part of the army. Uh, but clearly, uh, you know, any particular small unit doesn't win battles, let alone wars, uh, but many units together address a range of enduring military tasks. And really, this thought in experiment was intended to combine a number of technologies in a tactical system that might have wide-ranging operational effects. If my paper and presentation have done anything, I hope it's a demonstration that there's ample room for many technologies and capabilities to come together uh, for the infantry unit at the close area, at five 
uh, meters to five kilometers. And together, the complementary and interlocking tactical systems uh, provide a foundational multi-domain capability uh, through a highly lethal, mobile, protected, and aware small unit. Um, and it can provide significant advantages uh, for the Army and for the future battlefield. And again, I'd leave you with this, that multi-domain uh, uh, battle isn't truly multi-domain if land forces can't contribute to the fight at the closest, most human uh, tactical levels. Am I pleased to think about uh, this from the bottom up, not the top down? The Air Force and the Navy give us a real top-down view of warfare, but the Army needs to think at the granular scale of the human because it's at that scale and terrain that human lives operate. And from this foundation, it's then possible to think through higher echelons and support that might be needed to further enhance a unit like the MDS as the Army modernizes in order to, again, protect, transit, seize the land domain, and influence the people and armies that inhabit it. And with that, that's the end of my prepared remarks. If you have any questions, sir. So, Bill Buck, question is, that sounds like a lot of training, right? I'm just thinking about what General Perkins said yesterday and how you're going to get people through that um, equipment and ready to use it in a short period of time if you've got 10,000 guys coming and going every month. That's just an observation. Sure. In 1985, I was in the Infantry Officer Advance Course, and I wrote my thesis on um, the effects of EMP and a high altitude nuclear explosion where the other effects are negligible, but it basically fries everything we have. In our world today of super duper technology, what are we doing to harden ourselves? Sure. Yeah, two, two, uh, two answers to that. And I think uh, training is right. I think it's going to be all in the graphic user, the, the user interfaces and that sort of thing. I mean, I think if you looked back 30 years uh, ago, people looked at computers and said, you know, I can't use those. those are, there's only a market for six of them because nobody can program them, nobody can use them. Um, now, I mean, we all have supercomputers uh, in our pockets, and it's because of the user interfaces. So I think that there's going to be a whole lot of things that go on behind the scenes in order to get the right information to the soldier when they need them. And again, it is going to take a lot of training, but again, uh, it, it's really about um, enabling the soldier to use the, the technology available to really maneuver through that environment. The second piece is EMP. Um, and in, in relation to my presentation, if we've got high altitude EMP, uh, nuclear weapons going off, there's a, we've got bigger problems <laughs> than the multi-domain squad is going to have to deal with. But clearly, um, this uh, unit, the way I think of it, is you're in an urban environment and you can get small um, HPM rounds and that sort of thing miniaturized by 2035 to you see a unit across the, across the way, the first thing you do might lob one of those to take out their electronic systems uh, in order to kind of develop some of those advantages. So I think thinking about it at the tactical level is going to be important. Um, and we've gotten away from that since the Cold War, uh, where everything was in a Faraday cage. Uh, today, um, you know, we don't harden anything. And, and it's getting to be more of a problem as we shrink integrated circuits. Now, there may be some leap ahead technologies if we go to all end-to-end opti -end optical computing. Um, which may be a, a way to go forward, but it's something that we have to keep in mind. <laughs> Sir. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Defense One. Um, on the cheetah robot, do you, uh, I, I know that MIT was working on that under a grant from DARPA. Do you have a timeline for when you might be able to incorporate that into actual exercises? Uh, and um, also, was, do you have an industry partner on that? Because I, I was under the impression that Boston Dynamics was an industry partner and now they're no longer in the Yeah, I think contract. Google uh, is getting ready to divest themselves of Boston, Robo uh, Boston Robotics. But uh, so, you know, regardless of the individual partner, you know, my thought is that if there isn't a wheeled vehicle that it can do this in that time frame, I mean, there will be almost certainly a small wheeled vehicle that can do these kind of things. But uh, if you look at some of the videos about where robotics are now and where they've progressed over the past even five years in terms of legged robotics, um, I think the newest one can beat a human, you know, uh, at least on a, you know, a treadmill. And by 2035, you can easily manage it imagine these things moving at speed uh, over the over the battlefield. So in terms of a specific industry partner, no, but in terms of the state of the art, I'd put my money on these things moving pretty quickly over unimproved terrain out to 2040. Incorporating into exercises or? No. Okay. No. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, so um, 
so first of all, the, the, what, he, what Jeff's talking about is a vision. So this isn't about a, a time frame for him to put this in the Army system. Jeff does, isn't here representing the Army or the Joint Staff. He's representing himself, and he's presenting ideas to us. But uh, So one of the downfalls, at least from people that were fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan of future combat system, was the idea that uh, you would be able to engage forces out of direct fire contact. That way you have a light-skinned vehicle. And what we learned the last 15 years is that's not really possible. And you're not, you're not portraying that world, but when you kind of talked about it, you mentioned we'd have to have some breakthroughs in materials. What type of technological breakthroughs do you think are critical, as you've looked at this, uh, to, to break things loose and let us get to here? You mentioned materials. What are, uh, what are a few others that you think would empower us to be able to move in this direction? So, to, to, it, to my mind, the real adversary investments are in the battle networks and the ability to, of them to orient on our forces and to put guided weapons where they need to be. And in my mind, the, the most important thing we need to do is not armoring these things up because, I mean, even we, we found that even an IED, even, you know, Artillery shells that are lying around are going to go through, you know, our tanks. So the most important thing is to disrupt their ability to even look at our forces uh, when they're in contact. So I think the thing, if we can get a compact laser. Now you saw the Ponce has a 30 kilowatt laser in the Middle East right now. Um, the uh, Apache gunship the other day got that a little smaller. I couldn't find exactly what the uh, power level on that. But if you can get if you can get a small compact laser that can at least dazzle and scan the battlefield constantly, you can look at optics and know immediately with your AI what's looking at you. You can dazzle it immediately and you can burn the, uh, the optical system. So I think the idea of this optical shield and incorporating EW with that as well, if you can bring dirt, uh, direct, uh, digital radio frequency memory to the tactical level using metamaterial arrays and that sort of thing, lasers and uh, AI, all uh, together with uh, direct fire systems, I think you've got a, a capability to provide some, you know, again, this optical shield. And I think that's the most important thing for, at a small unit level because the armor isn't getting us there. Sir. Andrew Midzak, uh, Medical Research Material Command. A uh, question for you, and it builds off something that Mr. Hall brought up yesterday. In your model, in your vision, the soldier is really an interpretive device. He's interpreting signals from his exoskeleton, but that can be supplanted by an algorithm. What do you see as the value of the soldier in 2035, 2050? So again, <clears throat> I think the most important thing, the most important distinction between robotics and humans are this idea of context. Um, I think robots are gonna get even better than us with visual algorithms at being able to pick out someone with a weapon faster than even a unit. Uh, but than an individual human. So I think the human really needs to understand, hey, I, I have just transitioned from a major combat situation to a, uh, to a, to a uh, uh, sort of a, uh, 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 where I'm supporting the population and that sort of thing. And the soldier can provide the robotics, the context to understand, you know, when I should release my weapons, uh, when I should be on a tighter tether and that sort of thing. So the human really needs to be able to, to, to provide, again, mission command for the robotic systems, not just other humans on the battlefield, because there are going to be other thinking systems on the battlefield. So the raw computing things like uh, understanding the electromagnetic environment, um, again, target recognition, those, those things are all going to be automated. They're going to be taken over by robotics. But it's the human to understand why he's there and what the purpose of his unit, and to be able to extrapolate uh, where the fight may be going, uh, you know, because he's been trained uh, properly about understanding you know, why the unit's actually there in the first place. Uh, sir, you, I think you had a... Good morning, Jeff. Right here. Sir. Hi, my name's Scott Padgett. I'm with IBM. I lead artificial intelligence for DOD and Intel. Um, have you given much thought to uh, the robots that you were showing with the, the cheetah, if you will? So I'm reflecting on that Asymmetric warfare, ISIS went underground, they're in the tunnels, autonomy. Uh, have you given thought about, you know, I'm going back, 2nd Ranger Battalion, platoon leader, I now have a cheetah. Where, where does autonomous systems take over in the disconnected mode? Have you given any thought on what that will look like when there's not a human in the loop? Yeah, Thank the, you. The, so that, again, gets into, uh, you know, a whole 
range of issues, you know, and again, it's that about the human being able to provide mission command to the robot so it can sort of understand what situation it's in. Um, and, uh, you know, the ethics, I think what's going to be the, the hardest part is adversaries are going to go in this direction. They're going to put autonomous systems on the battlefield that are going to do things that we wouldn't do. Um, and so uh, we at least need to understand the sort of dynamics of, of you know, you know, how comfortable are we? And I think, again, you know, technology is uh, something that was invented after you're 25 years old. I think people in 2050 are going to be a lot more comfortable with robotic systems on the battlefield and in their lives as, you know, as all of our cars are driven by sort of by robots and not by us. Thank you, Jeff. Give Jeff a round of applause. So you can tell Jeff's a really smart guy and he probably dreams about this at night. So the one thing I did not mention that I should have about Jeff and, uh, and, and his um, business partner, Dave Fastman, is they have done a lot of the synthesizing of findings the last two years for the mad scientist. So when all of you read and provide feedback on the executive, effectively executive summary of two years of thinking about the future that each one of you have provided, uh, you'll see Mr. Becker and, and Dave Fassman several times in the, in the footnotes. And that's because Jeff's been coming to our uh, conferences and helping us think about what's, what are we being told and helping us uh, connect to other individuals and to help us put it in a way that is easily um, accessible and understandable to senior leaders and to, and to people who don't dream about this every day like Jeff Becker. So, uh, you'll see Jeff a, a lot in this document. We were going to publish the full work of Jeff and Dave Fastman in the next month where they've basically uh, put together uh, something that, you know, you'd, you'd have to spend several nights reading by your bedstand rather than one sitting over a cup of coffee. Uh, but I'd recommend you do that when you see us send that out and when you join APAN, you'll see that uh, because um, Jeff's been thinking about this a lot. He's really done a lot to help the Mad Scientist Program put what we're learning into accessible ways. So if you're in the virtual community, connect in on that. And if you're in a CDID out there, I would tell you that when you're thinking about the future, you ought to start with a lot of these products because I think guys like Jeff are, have been helping us think through what the future might look like. So thank you, Jeff, for that. Thank you very much. Here's your, uh, your coin. I suppose you don't have one yeah. yet. No, not yet. Okay. Make sure you don't have like two, that you don't like, <laughs> like a whole closet full of mad scientist swag. Your proclamation. Thank you. Your patch. Right. And your visual. Thank there. you very much. Appreciate well, thank it. Thank you. Thanks.